This is a list of all of the military conflicts that took place between 1776 and 1914 that interrupted food from some part of the world to the European continent. And here's the same list for North America. There is a reason you guys do so well. There is a reason why the United States is the global superpower, and it ultimately has to do with our geography. Now, the middle of this map, the tan area, the greater Midwest system, that's it. That's the single largest chunk of arable land in the world. It's more productive than the next two and a half put together. But as important as that is, it's really the blue lines that make all the difference, those rivers. Because as you guys know, moving things from A to B is a bit of a bitch. But if you float it, it's one twelfth the cost. And that assumes that the rail and the road infrastructure is already there. If you don't have that yet, you're talking a 50 to 1 differential on the flatlands, 100 to 1 differential on the highlands. In addition, the United States, lakes and forests to the north, mountains and deserts to the south, ocean moats to the east and the west. Physically, it is the most secured position on the planet. So if you take nothing else away from this presentation, take this. You're going to be fine. And because even in the worst case scenario, where we have a third Obama term, and midway through, there's a chopstick accident, and Vice President Donald Trump takes over, and then we spend the next 36 years bouncing back and forth between the Clinton and Bush legacies, you're going to be fine. We can't mess this up. We have tried. The US is condemned to be in the world's military, agricultural, industrial, and consumption superpower. It's baked in. Let's look at a few other producers, give you an idea for why they're doing so well in this moment of time. So you look at soy, you know, obviously the US is number one, but there's Brazil, a very strong number two. You look at beef, you're in a very similar situation. You go to corn, same. How has Brazil been able to do so well this last century when it really came out of nowhere back in the 1950s? Brazil had a 300-year history of underperforming. What's changed? Well, the topography ain't all that hot. Most of the Brazilian production is an area called the Cerrado. It's the area that's kind of hashed in there. It's a subtropical savanna, very high acidic soils, a native tree that almost sucks all of the fertility out of the system. You've got a steamroller acre after acre, and then you have to put 300 tons of lime down a year for 20 years. You basically have to terraform it to get it to grow. <clears throat> and even once you've done that, you have a topographical challenge. See that kind of butterfly shape in the mountains? Those are mountains about the same height as the Appalachians, so eight to 12,000 feet, roughly. But unlike the Appalachians, which are set back from the American East Coast, these mountains are right up on the coast. One of the reasons that Rio is such a spectacular city is because you've got the cliffs in the backdrop. Well, have you ever tried to run a rail line up a cliff? At the head of that butterfly, that one low spot, that's Sao Paulo, and that's where all of Brazil's agricultural produce tries to get to the wider world. And this is how they do it. Whoops. This is how they do it. Half truck. There's no rail line. The switchbacks are too steep. You can't even send a semi. So half truck. And if you were to take all 38 of the half trucks in that picture and load them in to one of these Mississippi barges, you'd be able to fill up one third of one of the 15. Transport costs in Brazil are anywhere from five to 100 times what they are in the American Midwest. And yet Brazil has managed to become the world's number two agricultural exporter. What's made that happen? We did. And when that changes, when the American mindset changes, when some of the things I'm talking to, going to talk about for the rest of this presentation evolve, you're going to see the United States step away from the rest of the global system, but still maintain its agricultural excellence. Places like Brazil will fall away. I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation talking about how that's going to happen, but I want to give you an idea of what the end result is. This is a calorie map. If you're dark green or dark blue, you're a major exporter. Everybody else is an importer. The oranges and the reds, they import over half of their calories. And in the world I'm going to describe, these are the ones that are looking at catastrophic drops in output. We are looking at one-third of global food production 
facing critical challenges in just the next five to 10 years. It won't be a straight line. There will still be challenges along the way. But the United States is about to reclaim the position that it's had for most of its history as the food provider. First, let's understand why things are the way they are. Now, back in what we consider ancient history in this room, the world was imperial. The French military protected, protected French trade between the French colonies and the French mainland. The British Navy did the same, the Japanese the Navy the same, and so on. It was a sequestered imperial system. You tried to avoid trading with your neighbor if you could, because you never knew when some idiot whose language you didn't understand was gonna throw a war, and you would lose access to some raw material or trade route or market that you thought was critical. You kept it in house. You built up your system yourself. You didn't interact. These systems competed for people, for resources, for markets, and eventually those competitions culminated into the Second World War. At the end of that war, the United States stepped back and said, okay, as the only country that really survived that war intact, we're gonna try something new now. Instead of everybody being different, we're gonna put everybody into the same pool. Everyone can trade with everyone else. We'll use our Navy, the only one to survive the war, to guarantee shipments from anywhere to anyone. In addition, we'll open up our market, allow everybody to export to the United States. You can export your way back to affluence after the war. In exchange, we want one thing, the ability to fight the Cold War our way. You heard that right. We bribed ourselves up an alliance to fight the Soviets. We basically bought the allegiance of about 80 countries to serve as cannon fodder in a nuclear war. Started out with the allies in Western Europe, eventually the Axis, and in the end, ultimately even the Chinese were brought on board to contain and ultimately beat back the Soviets. And it worked perfectly. Global population tripled, global GDP expanded by a factor of 10, and no matter where the Soviets turned, they faced an alliance that was economic in its bedrock that ultimately beat them. How'd we do it? Not all that complicated. The carrier on the left is a jump carrier. Sir, excuse me, the carrier on the right is a jump carrier. The carrier on the left is a super. One super has the combat capability of seven jumps. There are 10 jump carriers in the world, not one is American. There are 10 super carriers in the world. All of them are American. The United States has enjoyed a 10 to one power ratio versus the combined nations, the combined navies of the entire planet for 70 years. And the reason that free trade works, the reason that we live in this world, the reason that Brazil has been doing so well, is that the United States has chosen to put that power differential at the disposal of the global commons for seven decades. But we never use it for ourselves. As a percentage of GDP, the United States is the least involved economy in the world. Only 7% of GDP from exports, roughly half of that, is NAFTA. And this to maintain a global system that was designed to fight a war that ended 25 years ago. When you hear people like Hillary Clinton saying that she would renegotiate the TPP, or you hear people like Donald Trump saying that he would forcibly renegotiate every trade deal we have, this isn't rhetoric, this isn't the fringe, this is the culmination of 25 years of the Americans steadily, bit by bit, stepping back from the world. And we're now at the point that probably in the next presidency, whoever it is, that step being back will be complete. And if the United States isn't maintaining the global trade system, then we go back to a more mercantile system what the United States is perfectly capable of operating in after a short, mild recession. And the rest of the world just ceases to function in the same way. And if you're China, you're dependent on exports for 40% of your GDP, or Germany, you're dependent for 50%, you need to find a new way to operate without global reach because there's only one country in the world has that and it doesn't need it for trade. So that's piece one. The world's about to change largely because we're gonna let it change. Piece two is demography. Now this is a normal demographic profile. Children at the bottom, retirees at the top, simple mortality makes it a pyramid. 
you can split it into three rough chunks. First, you got your young workers, people roughly aged 40, excuse me, 20 to 45. These are the folks that are starting out. They're having kids, they're buying houses, they're buying cars, they're smoking pot. It's all about the spending. This is the consumption base. This is what drives modern economies. Then you've got your mature workers. <clears throat> These are people who are roughly aged 40 to 65. The kids are leaving home, the house is being paid down, they're not consuming much anymore. With them, it's about the saving. They're preparing for the retirement. So they're trying to sock away whatever they can. So the younger group consumes, the older group is the tax base and the investment base. And then you've got your retirees who can't take the volatility, so they pull their investments back from the system. Fewer stocks and bonds, more T-bills, more cash. It's a strict capital model. A small generation provides capital to a large generation. Interest rates tend to be high. You have to have a business plan to get a business loan. You have to have collateral. Crazy concepts. That's how it's supposed to work. Do we have any Canadians here today? I love Canadians. Hands up, Canadians. Come on, don't be shy. What the hell is wrong with you people? <laughs> Apparently, in 1974, you all forgot how to have kids. So in Canada, we got a lot of people aged 55 to 65. That's that capital-rich demographic. Canada has loads of taxes coming in, and they have used that to do, among other things, build a very generous social welfare system and still have enough cash left over to fund things like the Athabasca tar sands developments, something that couldn't have happened anywhere else at any other time. But in just seven years, the majority of that block will move into mass retirement. And instead of having people paying in taxes, you will have people drawing out pensions and health care. And Canada will go from the most capital rich it's ever been to the most capital poor. Making matters worse, if you work down that pyramid, you'll notice there aren't a lot of young people. That means that Canada has not had consumption-led growth in almost 20 years. And it's impossible for it to have consumption-led growth in the future. There just aren't enough young people. And there's going to be fewer as we move on. So no export-led growth, or excuse me, no investment-led growth, no consumption-led growth, that just leaves exports. Here's the United States. Now where are my baby boomers? People born between 1946 and 1965. Come on, don't be shy, hands up. Yeah, 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 you guys are a freaking Roman legion. You are the largest generation as a percentage of the population that the United States has ever had. And you do everything together. Now, the problem with your generation, well, one of the problems with your generation, is that there's too damn many of you. And when you entered the workforce all those years ago, you absorbed every job available, but there were still more of you to take jobs. So you pushed your way down the value-added chain, taking jobs that you were overqualified for, and you depressed wages across the board. Now that you're nearing retirement, you're doing exactly the same with your investment dollars. You have supersaturated every investment opportunity in the United States. You have taken risks chasing that one extra percent of yield. And so subprime, your fault. Enron, your fault. I'm not quite sure how to blame you for nylon, but I'm pretty sure that's your fault too. And now that you've taken everything in North America, you're going out searching the world for that last investment that you can get a little bit of money on before you go into retirement. So the brick boom, funded with your desperation money, you're actually now investing in municipal bonds in sub-Saharan Africa that are paying out less than municipal bonds in southern Minnesota did 10 years ago because there's too much boomer money. Now, where's Gen Y? People born 1981 to 2000, the millennials. It's a little early, but oh, there's some of you here. That's great. Usually they're not up yet. <laughs> now, Gen Y has exactly the same problem as their parents. There's too many of them. They're coming into the workforce, they're discovering that there aren't enough jobs. Now, Gen Y does have a couple things going for them that the boomers did not. First and most importantly, they're better educated than any other generation we've ever had in this country. They're more technically savvy. So when you're talking about the, the Uber economy and the idea that you're gonna have 14 careers over your life, they're actually fairly well prepared for that. Second, one third of them still live at home. And of the two thirds that did move out, fully half of those only did so because mom and dad are helping with the rent. 
So we are in the midst of the greatest generational wealth transfer in human history without anyone dying yet, which is a disaster for Gen X. Now, where are my Xers? 1966 to 1980. Huh? We're all here. God, that's depressing. There's 11 of us. And we have to pay for 75 million retiring boomers. We got screwed. When we entered the workforce, the boomers had already taken all of the jobs. So we were the perennial intern generation. And now that Y is swarming in and outpopulating us, we will never, ever have a president. Uh, and we can ensure, or we can live for sure, knowing that there will never be any meaningful changes to Social Security, Medicare, or Medicaid. Because Y and the boomers will work together to prevent it. Because if there were any changes, the boomers have to move in with their kids. And from Gen Y's point of view, that's strictly a one-way experience. <laughs> so it'll be up to Gen X to make up the difference. We're looking at a change in the marginal tax rate probably of upwards of 50% simply to make the books match. Now, as much as I dog on Y, and they do deserve that, thank God they're there. Because they are a large block of people in that magic 20 to 30-something age bracket. Their consumption is why the United States has experienced economic growth that's well above the global norm right now. And in 15 years, when Gen Y matures, and I use that term in its loosest possible way, <laughs> they will fill out the ranks of the tax-paying class in a way that Gen X never could. And our budget, our finances, go back to normal. 15 years. So the budget battles the last couple, that's just the beginning. We're going to face that every single year for the next decade and a half. But there is an end in sight. But there isn't anywhere else. This is the developed world without US data involved in 2030. Everyone else has the Canada problem. So in just 15 years, we are going to evolve from a world where the United States is the largest consuming power and largest financial power into one where we are the only consuming power and only financial power. Just 15 years. A few examples of what's going on in the rest of the world. Top left, that's South Africa. Walk up that pyramid with me. Primary school, secondary school, university, 50% chance of catching HIV and dying within five years. As a modern economy, South Africa is already dead. They cannot train up skilled labor faster than it is dying off. Top right, the Russian Federation. There was a 60% drop in the Russian birth rate at the end of the Cold War, which means that in the next five years, every single person in the Red Army will have been born during the baby bust, which means that the Russian Red Army will shrink by half in the next five years. If the Russians are gonna use military tactics and strategies in an attempt to reshape their world, they have to do it now. And so they are. Bottom right, People's Republic of China. After 25 years of the one-child policy, they're running out of 25-year-olds. People tell me that the Chinese are great at math. I have yet to see proof. You'll notice that there's a blue fringe on the right side of that graphic. That's the surplus male population. Because in a country that only allows one child and it's patriarchal, female infanticide is very common. There's a 10% sex imbalance. That's a lot worse than it sounds. Because when the industrialists realized they were facing labor shortages on the coast, they went inland to find new workers. They only brought back the women. Because you can put six chicks into a 300 square foot apartment. You do that with six dudes, you will have a severed head in the fridge by the end of the month. <laughs> Men and women are not simply separated by socioeconomic status in China now, they are physically separated by province. Now you may have heard that two weeks ago the Chinese decided to do away with one child. Well let's assume if on that steamy Wednesday evening every Chinese citizen paired up and set off to do their patriotic duty. How long does it take to grow a 30 year old? 30 years and nine months. So China has to figure out how to make their political economic system last for 30 years with collapsing labor availability, skyrocketing labor costs, 
and no hope for the consumption-led society that they hope is going to take them beyond exports. They are becoming more dependent on the American trade network, not less. And then finally, there's Brazil. Brazil's what we think of when we think of a young, dynamic, developing co country, right? The, the, the consumption of the future. Well, all of this is 2015 data except for Brazil. Brazil, that's 1990. Here's Brazil today. Brazil is aging at four times the European rate and six times the American rate. And by 2040, Americans on average will be younger than Brazilians. We'll be younger than the Chinese in just four years. Okay, third, let's talk shale. This is what I like to call the checkbook map because every light is someone with a checkbook because they can afford to pay their power bill. Three population centers I want to point out. First, the booming metropolis of Bismarck, North Dakota, that's up top. In the middle, the happening town of Midland, Texas, and down south, the absolutely boring Austin, San Antonio corridor where I live. People live there, there are lights. What are these? Western North Dakota? I don't think so. Nobody lives there. That's the Bakken Shale Field. In the center, you've got the Permian bases of, of West Texas, and down south, the Eagleford. Why are they lit up? These are unpopulated zones. It's all about transport. <coughs> Oil is easy to move from place to place. It's a liquid. You can hold it in your hands, put it in a bucket, your trunk, a rail car, a truck, you name it. Natural gas is different. It's difficult to contain, not to mention it's flammable. You have to move it from a pressurized point of production through a continuous pressurized transport system to a pressurized point of consumption. If you don't have that whole network, you don't have a natural gas industry. In the United States, no one's drilling for natural gas on purpose. They're going after the oil. The natural gas is a byproduct. And sometimes you can't build the pipes fast enough to capture that byproduct. It's not a high priority because you're selling it at zero. And so it flares. And you can see those flares from space. The one place that we're actually producing shale on purpose is here in the Marcellus. No flares there. Well, here's the fun fact. Natural gas is the most versatile base material in the world. It is the feedstock for almost every industrial process. It's valuable. Here in the United States, 50% of the natural gas we used this year so far was eventually put into the system at cost. We have the lowest natural gas prices in the world, the lowest input prices in the world. One seventh what they are in Europe, almost one tenth what they are in Japan now. And that allows the United States to be at the beginning of the greatest industrial renaissance of our lifetimes. We already have 900 billion, with a B, committed investment into natural gas transport and usage that will all be operational, all that new infrastructure will be operational within the next five years. It's the biggest build out since 1943. And it's working off of a base material that's free. Assuming for the moment no new technologies, no new exploration, nothing out of Canada, nothing out of the Gulf of Mexico, nothing out of Alaska, we have at least 35 years at today's prices, probably something closer to 70. And that's just the gas. The oil's pretty good too. This is oil production in the US. Blue is domestic oil production. Red and green are imports from Canada. The double hash is 2007. That's the first year that shale became available in commercial quantities. Here's consumption. Well, that's interesting. What happened in 2007? Well, we had three things. First, we had a recession. Industrial output dropped. Consumption dropped with it. But that ended six and a half years ago. Hasn't recovered. Second, we have something called demand destruction. When you're convinced that oil prices are going to be above, say, $80 for a long period of time, you change the way you operate. You put up solar panels, you buy a Prius. That Prius doesn't just destroy demand when it's yours. It is now part of the vehicle fleet, and it will be sold and resold down the line, and since it's a freaking Toyota, it'll be there for 20 years. That Prius, that one car, has destroyed 150 barrels of oil demand in the United States. Doesn't sound like much until you realize that there's four million of those suckers on the road now. That one technology, hybrid vehicles, have taken one full percentage point off of American energy demand. And we had oil prices above $80 for 10 of the last 11 years. Third, demography. 
When you're, convi or when you're 30 years old, you drive to work, you take your kids to soccer practice. When you're 55, you just drive to work. When you're 70, you don't drive much at all because your kids are trying to take away your car. <laughs> per capita oil demand declines with age. And in 2007, the oldest of the baby boomers retired. We are looking at bare minimum 15 years of secular oil demand decline in this country at the same time that the natural gas is equivalent free. We are no more than two years, probably closer to a year and a half, away from North American oil independence. And the prices are getting better and better. Horizontal is volume, vertical is cost. The blue bar at the far left, that was shale as of 2012. Very expensive per barrel, not a lot coming out. There's a series of technologies, everything from 4D seismic to multilateral drilling to refracking that are becoming industry norm right now, will be industry norm by the end of next year. And they have already driven the break-even prices in the major four shale fields from north of 90 to about 43. By the end of next year, that'll probably be in the 30 to the 35 range which means that U.S. shale is about to become cost competitive with every oil producer in the world outside of the Persian Gulf. We're in a fundamentally new era. And what people don't realize is that while food is a globalized commodity, oil is not naturally so. And as soon as we have a disruption in oil production anywhere in the world, Russia, Ukraine, Iran, India, you name it, this happens to global oil prices. Over there, you have high prices based on long-haul transport, state-owned companies, international threats. And over here, you have low oil prices based on domestic consumption, domestic production, short-haul transport, and private ownership. You can easily have crude in the 40 to 60 range here while it's in the 150 to 250 range everywhere else because oil exports from the United States are illegal and oil exports from Canada only go to the United States. For that to change, Congress would have to consciously choose to submit their voters to oil prices that are triple what they are now, when they had, would have an option to do otherwise. So even if that oil export ban is lifted in the next few months, it'll get slammed right back down the next time we have an international crisis. There's no arbitrage, there's no trade, there's no price discovery, you can have a split in the market. Let's talk about how that's gonna happen. First, let's talk about the Russians. Now, we know they're desperate. We know their population is collapsing. So if they're going to move, they're going to move now. Here's how they're going to do it. The red is re Russian ethnic populations. The orange are Russophilic populations, roughly allied with Russians, but they're not actually ethnically Russian. They speak Russian. They like Russian culture. And then the greens, those are the Stockholm Syndrome states. They really want to go back to the Soviet system. Now, there are a series of geographic barriers on the western edge of that red zone the tallest of which is slightly shorter than an interstate on-ramp in Kansas. It's a wide open terrain. There's absolutely nothing that the Russians can hunker behind. And with an army that's collapsing, they know that their border is absolutely defenseless. So in the Russian mind, they would like to expand out and anchor their forces in these five gaps. Their thinking is, if they can forward position troops there, Instead of a 2,500-mile western periphery, they only have a 600-mile periphery. And that's something they can handle with a smaller army. Now, obviously, there are countries between here and there that are going to have some opinions on that topic. Several of them are in NATO. I don't think the United States is going to get involved. The Russians are going piecemeal. They want to see how people react. And so far, they haven't been impressed with what's happened in the United States or Europe. And if in a couple more years, the Americans have gotten used to being energy independent and are starting to step back from the world at large, then it's a European issue. And we enter a world where the French are asking the Germans to invade Poland to fight off the Russians, which sounds crazy until you look at your European history and you realize that sort of stuff happens all the time. From an energy perspective, though, here are the major export routes. Six million barrels of Russian crude a day flows through what is going to be a conflict zone. And if half of that goes offline, you can easily add $100 a barrel to the price of crude. 
When the new Iron Curtain falls, that will have implications far beyond energy markets. And for you guys, it'll be fantastic. Not only will you guys have cheaper energy, there's a fertilizer component to this. Roughly one third of the world's potash comes from Belarus and Russia, areas that are gonna be behind a new Iron Curtain. We get ours locally or from Canada. No change here. So just the ability to keep the crops moving is something that North America will again have a distinct advantage in. Not to be outdone by the Russians, you've got, whoa, did we lose a slide? Yeah, we lost a slide. Okay, I gotta talk about the Middle East real quick, but I don't have a graphic for it apparently. Between the Iranians and the Saudis, you've got two countries that we have kept apart courtesy of an aircraft carrier battle group in the Gulf for really the entirety of the post-Cold War period. You've got a Sunni power, you have a Shia power. You have a theocracy, you have a monarchy. And now, economically, you even have a new clash. Because North America is no longer an oil importer from the rest of the world, those two countries, Saudi Arabia and Iran, are exporting exactly the same types of crude exactly along the same route to exactly the same customers. It's a rivalry that will transcend the ages, and like all great rivalries, eventually someone ends up in the wrong bar. And the problem that the Iranians have is they've got three million Shia living on top, or three million Arabs living on top of their oil production zone. Well, Iran's not an Arab country, it's a Persian country. And so the Saudis are working to foment rebellion in that oil zone. Not to be outdone, there are three million Shia living in Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Sorry, in Arab Saudi Arabia. Also living right on top of the oil production zone, the Guar Superfield. The Iranians are using their intelligence services to spark a rebellion in Saudi Arabia. Assuming nobody else gets involved, assuming there's no artillery exchange, that's already 11 million barrels of crude facing dispute. Take out one tanker, and we'll see what happened in the 2000s happen all over again. And then you get the Asians involved. The green lines specifically on the left of the map are oil imports. The red lines specifically, I'm sorry, the green lines are oil exports. The red lines specifically on the right of the map are oil imports. You notice how far apart those are. That's about a 7,500 mile sail. That's been the problem that the United States Navy has had ever since the Cold War began how to make sure that the energy can get from where it's produced to where it's consumed by our allies. Well, in a world where the US is stepping back, in a world where oil supplies are threatened, East Asia has a real problem, because it doesn't matter if the disruption's in Ukraine or Iran, they are at the end of the world's supply chain. They have to import crude the longest, and everybody else gets their cut along the way. So for these four countries, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and China, to maintain energy functionality, they are going to have to forward deploy their navies and start convoying all the way from the Persian Gulf. Now, assuming for the moment that you can't see enough things that could go wrong with them picking sides in a Middle East knife fight, think of this. We all know that Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and China have a centuries-long history of brotherly cooperation, right? What happens the first time that they take a shot at one another, or confiscate a cargo, or sink a cargo. The global supply chain collapses. Bretton Woods free trade foundation is freedom of the seas and safe and reliable transport. That has taken every supply chain in the world and broken it down first into dozens and then into hundreds of individual pieces. Whoever has the competitive advantage for the rivet, or the computer chip, or the copper smelting has it, and then they assemble in different places. You break down the supply chain network, and all of a sudden those supply chains have to recollapse into much, many fewer spots. And we're not only going to have to move into a world where supply and demand and inputs are secured physically, but are co-located. And courtesy of shale, the only place in the world that that happens is North America. The reindustrialization wave we're seeing right now, this is just the first part. The United States is once again going to be the workhouse of the world. In these maps, the, uh, the, the Don dominant color, in this case the browns, that shows where there are major consumers, in this case the Chinese. 
And it's really important for you guys to understand how the Chinese fit into this new world, because it's not a pretty picture. But at the end of the day, I think you're going to like where it leads. It's more volatile, but that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. First things first, how the Chinese system works. It's not like the United States where you work with business, land, business plans and collateral. The whole concept is if someone can guarantee a single job, then that employer qualifies for a bottomless supply of 0% loans. It's all about preventing people from getting together in large groups and going on long walks together. Keep them employed, give them something to do. And in doing so, you have a very large banking sector in China. Now in 2007, the year in which American credit was at its peak, our subprime crisis, Chinese credit in absolute terms was already triple what it was here, despite the fact that their economy was roughly a third of the size of the US economy that year. It then doubled over the next two years in response to the financial crisis because people weren't buying Chinese exports. Looks like they got it under control, but no, they really just found new and creative ways of forcing money through the system. Credit overall tripled. And in the last three years, we now have something called, uh, excuse me, <coughs> social funding, shadow funding. Everything from illegal hedge funds to loan sharking is now part of the Chinese lending mix. And I need to change the scale here so you can see how big it is. You guys remember the Obama stimulus package, right? You know, $800 billion, 3% of GDP over two years. We wondered how we could ever spend all of that without corruption and fraud. Well, this is an Obama stimulus package now every 22 days. Can you get growth with this? Well, yeah, how could you not? But if something happens to the financial sector for whatever reason, it all goes away. Because this, this isn't subprime. This is every sector of the Chinese system is overcredited. Now what the Chinese have been trying to do for the last five years is move away from this system. They're like, okay, we know we have a problem. Let's come up with solutions. But they didn't want to peel out the banks while they were doing that because it would have triggered an immediate depression and probably a social implosion. And the problem they have now is that all of their solutions have become equally overcredited. The first one that they tried to do was develop the interior. Now this is China on its side. The dark brown areas are populated China, and the green area is the uh, irrigated, or excuse me, the, uh, the arable land. The first wave of development hit those southern cities, those pockets from Shanghai down to Hong Kong. These are places that have a history of participating in international supply chains. They have a history of international connections. They have a history of importing the majority of their food. But when they tried to do the move inland program in these cities, you go inland, you hit subtropical mountains. So that couldn't work. So the places with the most expertise in developing were no longer in the game. So they moved to the right of the map into the interior. Northern China, where Beijing is. Not where the economists are, not where the mercantilists and the industrialists are. This is where the military folks live. This is the political heartland. They pushed inland. They were quite successful in developing things. But what they discovered was there's not a single navigable river in northern China. So first, they had to subsidize the infrastructure development. Then they had to subsidize the industrial development. And now they have to subsidize the products that are made. So all they've really done is doubled down on a bad strategy. They've added a lot of concrete and a lot of steel, but none of it actually is economically viable. Stage three. You take a bottomless supply of capital, you give an artificial political goal, some really strange things happen. You get ghost cities, which can now house about 70 million people. This isn't my favorite one. This is my favorite one. That is not Paris. That is Tian Duchenne. It is currently at about 10 to 15% occupancy. It's in southern China. And almost everybody who lives there works at the next door French theme park construction site. Love it. Now the Chinese have come across a, a little bit more traditional bubble from our point of view. Bottomless supply of capital, chasing the limited supply of things. Housing prices for pre-existing housing has gone through the roof. Well, if you're a peasant living in a 300 square foot apartment in northern Shanghai, you can cash out for three to five million dollars. And what do you do when you have three to five million dollars? Well, you go out and you buy a car. China now has more Lamborghinis in garages that have never been driven than the rest of the world put together. They're status symbols. 
These people can't actually drive. In fact, the Chinese have a name for them. It's called Tu Hao, which roughly translates as Beverly Hillbilly. It's a whole class of people who have become millionaires overnight through no fault of their own. I mean, good for them. I, I wouldn't mind having a Lamborghini in my garage. The next thing they do is they put the money in the stock market. 80% of the value of the Chinese exchanges in June, just before everything went south, were retail investors. The only place in the United States where retail investors make up that sort of percentage is Kickstarter. This is not a normal system. And the Chinese realize that they're now in a world where the financial bubble, the stock bubble, the lending bubble, the infrastructure bubble, and the development bubble are all bolted together at the hip, and they're all falling at the same time. They're preparing for what happens after this stage of their economic development. And it's pretty ugly, not personally, strategically. What the Chinese are doing is starting to reconsolidate political power into the apex leadership. The idea is they're trying to get the average Chinese citizen to not think that he needs to have a job, not think that, that he needs to put food on his family's table, but to instead trust Xi personally to do what's right. And the way they're doing it is an anti-corruption campaign. If you execute publicly enough important people, you can buy the loyalty of the rank and file. That's the goal. Already, more power has been consolidated into President Xi than into any Chinese leader that comes before him, with the exception of Mao. They are laying the groundwork for life after a normal economic evolution. Every time the Chinese have done some version of this before, it's led to state collapse, or at least regional collapse. This doesn't necessarily have to be a disaster for you, though, because the last thing any government does before it turns the light out is somehow impinge food supplies. If you are selling into the right area, this is a remarkable opportunity. But you'll be dealing less with Beijing and the national authorities and more with, say, a Fujian and the regional authorities. There's also other good news. Just because China's going away doesn't mean that industrial capacity is going to vanish. It will be picked up by other regions. And the one that I think is most promising is Southeast Asia. Now, what you've got here, these two shades of green, that's subtropical and tropical terrain. And as you guys know, in agriculture, there are few things worse in this world than working in tropical agriculture. In grain-based agriculture, in livestock agriculture, you can always add technology and capital to boost your productivity. Own more land, get a bigger tractor, do better. You can't do that in the tropics, because those coffee beans, those pineapples, those have to be harvested, transported by hand. It's unskilled labor, always will be. And if there's one thing unskilled labor doesn't appreciate, it's being unskilled labor for their whole life. So they leave when they can. And what they've done in Southeast Asia is they've moved into these dense urban environments where labor costs are negligible. And so whether it's low-skilled, middle-skilled, or high-skilled, Southeast Asian labor is higher skilled than its equivalent around the world at a cheaper price. And if you're living in the cities, you're not producing your own food. Every one of these countries has become a massive agricultural importer, and as the more problems that the Chinese have, this is where the food is going to go. It is the biggest agricultural growth market in the world for the next 30 years. And it's young and hungry. Almost unique around the world, these are one of the few places where you actually have young populations, relatively constrained labor costs, and a growing demand for foodstuffs. It's perfect. Now let's talk about a couple more commodities and where that hits. OK, the wheat world is primarily the Northern Hemisphere plus the Australians. I want to talk, we've already talked about the Russians. I want to talk about the Europeans here. And, and one more thing. This is just fun. I mapped out where turkey production comes. Wow. White people love turkey. Look at that. <laughs> and there's not an import map. All the white people export their turkey to each other. Isn't that amazing? If you guys can get anyone else in the world to like turkey, convince them like it's a, it's a luxury crop here, wow, you guys are going to make mad money. I mean, talk about an untapped resource. Wow. Whew. Anyway, let's talk about the white people. Northern European Plain, second largest chunk of arable land in the world, second largest concentration of navigable waterways. It, this is the industrial, political, military, economic heartland of the continent. If every place in the world looked like Northern Europe, it would be rich, but it would also probably be at war with each other. That's a whole other presentation. 
Not every place in Europe, though, is like Northern Europe. Not everybody has those flat lands and those navigable rivers. You've got mountains, you've got islands, you've got peninsulas, places that are more expensive to develop. What the Europeans decided to do was to put the entire area, regardless of topography, regardless of levels of economic stability or likelihood of growth, into the same currency zone. The idea was <coughs> that the surplus capital of the North can flow to the periphery, primarily Southern Europe, and help it develop, build infrastructure, expand educational standards, bring them up to Northern European standards of living. It was a noble goal, but there were a couple of built-in flaws. First of all, Europe already had a free trade zone, which means that if you are living in Spain, would you rather have a German car or a Greek car? Because in the Eurozone, the interest rate on those loans are exactly the same. And what the Euro has instead done is hollowed out the entire industrial base of the South and transferred all of those jobs and all that production to the North, where it's more efficient. In the last 15 years of the Euro, 50 years of European integration has dissolved. And as long as the Euro continues to exist, Spain and Italy and Greece do not have a chance at a successful future. So let's talk about Greece. The gray line, that is where the IMF put total Greek debt as a percentage of GDP. And you see where it's split in three? That's what happened earlier this year when we had a lot of political shenanigans in Athens. The gray line is where it was supposed to go. The black line is where the IMF upgraded their assessment for where it was going to be in June. And then the red line is where they thought it was going to be just in July, one year later. And that, with the deal that is in the process of being ratified right now, here's where we are now. 200% of GDP in government debt. That's double what we have here in the United States for an economy that is far less stable and is not the global currency. The blue line up top, that's Japan. Because Japan is now the only country in the world that you compare Greece to. If you are a European and you look at this, you're like, how do we fix this? 200% of GDP is well beyond Greece's capacity to ever recover. They might be able to handle 40 to 50% of GDP. That's it. Anything beyond that is hopeless. The European solution was to push for draconian austerity that would never end. But because the Greeks can never pay this off, that means that the debt level is going to rise up a little bit more every year. They'll have to do bailouts every two to three years just to keep it even. It's a non-solution. It guarantees the destruction of Greek, the Greek state and the Greek society over the long run. And yet, this is what the Europeans chose. Why? It seems like a horrible idea. Well, it's because the other solutions are even worse. Solution number two would be to forgive some of that debt, knock it down to 40 or 50 percent of GDP so it could be paid back. Thing is, Greece is not the most indebted country in Europe, especially not when you add up consumer debt and corporate debt. It's only, I mean, it's in the top 10, but Belgium's worse, Ireland is worse. And if you're gonna forgive the Greeks of 100% of GDP or of debt or more, you have to do it to other countries. The Europeans have had seven years to build a ring fence around Greece. They haven't done that anywhere else. So if you do have that volume of debt forgiveness, it will lead to a series of cascading failures across the entire European banking sector. That is an option they dismissed day one, because this would destroy Europe as it now exists. And then third, Grexit. Grexit's a fun topic. Kick them out. Let them devalue their currency. Let them actually become competitive again. There's a problem with that. If you kick Greece out and their currency drops by 80%, that means their debt load goes from 200% of GDP to 1,000% of GDP, even less sustainable. That means they default on the whole thing. Well, Greece imports 80% of their food and 100% of their energy. Who wants to give them a letter of credit for energy or food imports after they've defaulted on $500 billion in debt? Anyone? Usually there's a Greek guy in the back who puts his hand up. When the food runs out and the power goes out, if you're Greek, what do you do? You start walking to where there's food and power. We have seen that the Europeans cannot deal with 40,000 boat people or 100,000 Syrian refugees. Can you imagine if 8 million angry Greeks show up in southern Bavaria next Tuesday? The other solutions don't work. The Europeans are just marking time. 
and they're running out. They really only have about eight years to figure out how to get the European system to work without the euro, and it's demographic. This is a chart from 2000 showing the combined demography of the southern European states, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain. You'll notice that there's a big bulge in the 20s and 30s, lots of consumption, but not a lot of kids. This is the environment that existed when the euro was introduced. So if you were an Italian and your interest rates were 15%, the next day you join the euro and they drop to two and a half. It's the equivalent of giving an 18-year-old an American Express black card and just telling them to go. And they did. Debt doubled in three years. You had a consumption boom that was lightning huge. And look at that age demographic. Because there weren't a lot of kids, this wasn't rent and diapers. This was Maseratis and vacations. This is the perfect demography for consumption-led growth. And the growth we saw in Europe from 2000 to 2007, everyone assumed that was the new normal. Everyone declared that the euro was a success. Well, 15 years later, we're all 15 years older. On the right, you've got Italy and Spain, or excuse me, Italy and Greece. Their demographies have now aged past the point of demographic recovery. I don't care what the tax policy is. I don't know what the care what the social policies are. I don't care how free the daycare is. You cannot get 40-somethings to generate kids like they're Salvadorian teenagers, not even in Italy. Bottom left is Poland. They're about five to 10 years younger on average, but their birth rate drop post-Cold War was even steeper. So the consumption there is real, but it's also temporary. And then finally, there's Germany. Big bulge of people in the 50s. Engineers in their 50s, that's what you want. People who know everything there is about their trade. So the Germans can outcompete everyone on quality right now. And because they're in the same currency zone with the rest, especially the Greeks, the euro is cheaper than it should be. They can outcompete everybody on cost as well. But only for another eight years. In eight years, that bulge moves into mass retirement. And all the tax payments that are currently paying for all those European bailouts, that goes away and the German export machine shuts down. So the Europeans have eight years to figure out how to make Europe work without exports, without consumption, and without money. That'll be a neat trick. One final country I want to talk about is Mexico. Mexico is the market of the future for you guys. I know for a lot of you it's already your number one market, but let me explain why and let me explain how it's going to get a lot better. So first things first. Mexicans live a mile above sea level in the middle of the country. They have to get out of the tropics. Tropics in the south, deserts in the north, largely unpopulatable. They live in the middle. That puts them in the mountains. Notice all those orange squiggles? That's irrigated agriculture. And as you know, irrigated agriculture is always more expensive than when the rain just falls out of the sky. But that's how the Mexicans generate most of their calories. But because it's in the highlands as opposed to the Great Plains of Nebraska, any infrastructure you build in one valley can't help the next one over. So it's the most expensive type of topography that you can have. It's the opposite of the United States. No navigable rivers here, bad land, high land. The only country in the world with a worse topography than Mexico for human development is Afghanistan. Mexico should be a failed state. But it's obviously not. It has problems, don't get me wrong, but it's not a failed state. It's because of its proximity to the United States and four major factors are gonna make it the economic success story of the next 50 years. First, shale. Not theirs, ours. We have natural gas as a waste product, particularly in Texas. Every line that is on this map is a natural gas transport trunk line. Anyone that is not in red is one that is under construction and will be completed by the end of next year. At the end of next year, natural gas exports will, going into Mexico will have increased by a factor of 11 compared to three years ago and blackouts will be a thing of the past in the Mexican industrial sector. We will be supplying them with fully half of their energy needs. It will be the largest bilateral energy relationship in human history. Second, labor costs. Here's some labor costs from Southeast Asian states on a monthly basis. Here's Mexico, competitive, right in the middle, and here's China. Chinese labor costs have increased by a factor of nine in the last 15 years. Mexican labor costs are now cheaper and more highly skilled, not to mention proximate to the American market. Third, it's gonna stay that way. 
The Mexicans have a very positive demography. It's flattened a little bit down at the bottom, but that's actually helping with their local consumption. They're the world's 12th largest economy now. And their labor costs are not gonna be skyrocketing like they are in much of the rest of the world because they don't face the demographic pressure. And then finally, the drug war. From an economic point of view, that's probably the best thing that's ever happened to the country. That requires a little bit of explanation. People primarily do not go into Mexico to service the local market. They go in to take advantage of not necessarily cheap labor, but the difference in labor costs between Mexican labor and American labor. It's the differential they're after. Well, the more successful the US, the higher our educational standards, maybe we actually elect a Congress that's worth a damn. You know, Labor costs in the United States rise. The differential is wider. It makes more sense to invest in Mexico. The worse the drug war is, the more beheadings there are, the more kidnappings there are, the cheaper Mexican labor gets, the bigger the differential, and the more it makes sense to invest in Mexico. We've seen FDI in New Mexico quadruple during the drug war, because it just makes economic sense. There are, of course, downsides. This is uh, smuggling routes of cocaine from Venezuela and Colombia into Miami. Everybody went to Miami. You guys all remember Miami Vice, right? Hookers and Blow, great family show. There's a reason why every episode ended on such a, a sad note. It's just because you had local law enforcement trying to deal with transcontinental economic phenomenon. Of course they'd lose. But at the end of the Cold War, the US changed some of its defense policies. Instead of ignoring this, we redeployed a few forces. We started shooting down small planes that were flying at night with no lights on, 10 feet over the water, because those weren't scuba divers. And the smuggling routes changed. They went to the west, on land, through those mountain valleys, to places where the Coast Guard couldn't go. And what's happening now is that the cartels are doing exactly the same thing that any large corporation in their place that doesn't control their whole supply chain would do. They're diversifying horizontally into related industries like cargo theft, kidnapping, local government. That was funny, sorry. <laughs> and vertically, and they're coming down across the United States to take over distribution, interfacing with the gangs directly, wiping them out often. One of the reasons that our murder rate has dropped by so much in the last few years is that the cartels are killing the people that do the killing. So worry about this if you want to worry about something. But from a sales to Mexico point of view, Mountainous country, desert country, tropical country, highland country cannot possibly feed itself. And as people move into the cities to take advantage of the jobs, as labor costs stay low, as the industrial boom continues, this is a country that will have to import more and more and more food, and it is not limited by anything that's happening internationally. All the fun and games going on in China and Europe, the former Soviet Union, the Middle East, don't affect Mexico. It's just the drug war. One more country I just want to talk about very briefly is Cuba. In a globalized world where free trade's a big deal, Cuba's a minor issue. In a more mercantile world where the United States focuses more on North America, a hostile government in Cuba will not last. The Cubans have seen this coming. They've asked for terms. We're negotiating the terms of the new relationship right now. This is going to be the single largest new market for you because they work on tropical tropical agriculture and nothing else. Whether it's soy or wheat or corn, they import almost all of it, and there is no reason that the United States cannot fill their every need. There is a cost. If you produce sugar in this country, you will go out of business, because their sugar is higher quality and lower cost than anything that we produce anywhere in the United States. That's the trade-off. Sugar for everything else. If you're looking for countries that are gonna grow over the long term, this is your list. These are the demographically stable to growing countries in the world that are still gonna have physical security. This is all of them. This doesn't mean you can't sell food elsewhere. It just means you're gonna to have to be much more aware of what's going on the ground. And finally, crop by crop. Let me get the bad news out of the way first. Soy producers. You're the product that is most dependent upon exports, and you're the product that has most going to danger states like the Chinese. This isn't necessarily bad. It just means that there's a big hiccup in your future. Most of that soy is used to feed animals. As the Chinese start having dislocation in a very large way, they're gonna be shifting from meat back to vegetable protein. 
Guess what soy is? So there's gonna be some hiccups along the way, but I do not expect five years from now that you're gonna be exporting less soy than you are now. It will just be consumed differently. For those of you in ethanol, you're dependent upon a bureaucrat telling you, telling people how much they have to use. The coalition between the national security folks and the energy folks is gone. It's now just the congressional caucuses that are pushing for ethanol use. You might want to consider where that's going to put you in five years. For everybody else, you're actually not exposed to the danger states. You're exposed where you need to be, North America and Southeast Asia. Eggs and beef, you're probably the ones that are in the biggest problem because you have about one-fifth of your total exports do go to the Chinese market. But over half of that goes to the right part of China, the southern Chinese cities that are still going to be consuming, that are still going to be wealthy. So overall, the mix for you, people in this room, it looks phenomenal. And it wouldn't be a presentation by me if it didn't have a map at the end. So countries in blue, those are the ones that will rule the chaos in the future. Countries in green, more or less where they are now. The yellows, they do have something going for them. They're going to face challenges, but they have a unified population, self-sufficient in energy, a good ally. The browns don't. And those are countries that are going to be falling apart. As for the reds, if you don't know their names now, don't bother learning them. They won't be there in five years. All right, I am right at time. Do we have time for a couple of questions? How about them, folks? Shoot. Um, I work in the governor's office, and we just had a statement from Mexico and sort of the focus was agriculture. And as we're looking to go on more state missions um, in the future, the governor actually wants to go back to Mexico. So would you agree to push in hard on Mexico, or is there another, what other country is? Sure. The question is whether or not Mexico, sh or the state of Mexico should push for trade missions in Mexico versus other places. Definitely hit Mexico hard. I'd also look at Central America very closely. It's going to be more complex from an organizational point of view, but they have a very similar to topographical setup to Southeast Asia, and so they're very hungry for the base food stuffs. They ex export things that we consider exotic, but they need all the base materials. Uh, Southeast Asia, if you're looking for some specific examples that I think would work well uh, with Minnesota, I would look at places where the delta is going to be very big. Places like Myanmar and Vietnam, which are only now coming in into the international system, both of which have very positive relations with the United States and a lot of room for growth. If you're looking for something that's a little bit more mature, mature in a bigger market, uh, Indonesia and Malaysia. One is a mid-skilled, one is a mid-to-high-skilled. Both of them are massive food importers. Uh, the last uh, slide you had there showing the rising stars. I noticed Argentina. Argent freaking uh, Tell me what brings that around. Yeah, sure. No, it kind of hurts for me to make Argentina blue. Hey, hey folks, can we bring up the last slide? Uh, it kind of hurts uh, for me to, to put Argentina up there, considering you know the government. Uh, but here's the deal. Argentina is the world's third largest concentration of interlinked navigable waterways and the world's fourth largest chunk of arable land, the Pampas. They perfectly overlay. So they have everything that the United States and Northern Europe has traditionally had going for them. So all you need is a change in government. And within five years, Argentina can reemerge as one of the world's top 10 exporters of oil, natural gas, corn, soy, wheat, rice, you name it, beef. They'll do fantastic. If you don't have a change in government, and we move into a world where rule of law breaks down, where international trade's hard to do, where finance is difficult, Argentina has 15 years of hands-on expertise already. So it's not so much that they're moving to the median, it's that the median is moving to them. Either way, Argentina is going to do very well in the next decade. Does that mean I think you should all run out and invest in Argentina right now? No. Uh, just be aware uh, that circumstances are either changing in Argentina or around Argentina, and either way, they're going to come out ahead. Oman? Oh, well, to be perfectly blunt, um, well, the current leader of Oman, Sultan Qaboos, smart guy, probably the best leader in the region. Uh, he has taken communists and jihadists and tribal folks and welded them into a single nation. The problem is he doesn't have a successor and he's gay, so he's probably not going to get one. And he's in his 80s and he's dying. 
And uh, the secession plan is you guys figure it out, and if after three days you haven't, open this envelope, it's got a name in it, and he's your new sultan. I don't think that's gonna work. I, I had a question regarding um, Alberta oil sands oil sure. and the Keystone. So with about four million barrels a day coming out of there, that was gonna come to the US via pipeline, the Canadians are probably just gonna send the pipeline to Vancouver and export to China. So if we have four billion or four million barrels a day kind of leaving North America, what, what influence or impact would that have on North American oil price? It's only about two, two and a half, but your, your point is still a good one. Uh, the problem is it's not gonna go west and it's not gonna go east. Um, the debate in British Columbia is not between whether or not to build a pipeline to Alberta or not. It's a debate between do we take half of revenues, not profits, revenues, or do we start sponsoring groups to physically destroy the oil sector in Alberta? Yeah, so no pipeline is gonna go through British Columbia at all. Uh, the next most likely option is, aside from a presidential change and then building the pipeline, is to go east through Saskatchewan, Manitoba, through the Canadian Shield, all of Ontario to Quebec and make the world's second largest pipeline. Um, the operating costs would be high, the construction costs would be ridiculous, and if they started work today, it wouldn't be finished in eight years. But you have to have all of those provinces, most notably Quebec, sign off on it. So Keystone's still the best option. Um, I think it's already too late, though. The Albertan tar sands are not cost competitive with $60 crude, much less $40 crude. And it has to be railed out, which adds seven to eleven dollars per barrel to the cost to bring it to market. And the only refineries in the world that can operate on Albertan crude are in the United States. So if the pipeline doesn't happen, the Albertan tar sands are just going to shut down. Now they may come back online in 20 years when we start having issues with shale. I don't know, uh, but we're probably looking at the end of that economic sector up there. Sorry. Yes, Peter, I read your book. It's tremendous. Thank you. I was you. really impressed about what you had to share about the natural ports here in the U.S. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Also, the whole Mississippi and all the tributaries leading from the agriculture production areas of the U.S. down the Gulf. Right. The, the, the Mississippi system by itself is about 13,000 miles of navigable waterway. If you throw in all the others, you're up to about 18,000. The rest of the world put together only has about 125 so in terms of the ability to move things from A to B for whatever purposes, especially when you're talking about low value, high bulk products like agricultural raw produce, you know, you can't beat it. We can ship uh, raw material, corn, soy, you name it, from southern Minnesota to southern France cheaper than the French can get it from northern France to southern France. And that is why you guys have always done so well, historically. Uh, in terms of ports, especially when you're looking at the Gulf and the East Coast, you know, we've we could probably expand our port capacity by a factor of five without having congestion. We just have that much. Uh, the, the Texas coast and Chesapeake Bay in particular are remarkably robust. Things get tight on the west coast because the cliff system and the population system is different. But everywhere else, we are the low cost transporters of the world. And we have chosen to set that to the side to make the global system work. We have chosen to not compete as hard as we can in order to help all of our allies during the Cold War be our allies during the Cold War. My argument is that's all going away. The U.S. is, politically, it's, it's done with free trade, at least for now, and we're gonna have this period of retrenchment militarily, economically, politically, and that will provide opportunities for some regional powers to take advantage of the situation, but the thing is, there are not very many regional powers around the world that actually have capacity. There's really only eight, and most of them are diametrically opposed to each other. So we're going to see wars, the Germans versus the Russians, the Iranians versus the Saudis, but we're not going to be involved in them. And from an American strategic point of view, that's brilliant. And from an American agricultural point of view, it means there's a lot of markets that used to be serviced from other producers that suddenly will not be. And we still have the ability to protect global trade, we'll still protect ours. For you guys, that just means you have to be a little bit more careful about where you're working, and you have to work a little bit more hand in glove with the Department of State, which I realize is a pain in the ass, but it'll be worth it. Yes. Hi, thanks, Peter. Um, quick question about Sub-Saharan Africa, um, or remember, sorry, South, part of the South Africa. You mentioned that briefly, but are there other parts of South Africa with the underdeveloped economies, and you, those aren't, you know, 
anything above the brown level? Is there anything, any other reasons that, that may enhance that region or zone? It, it looks pretty dark. Uh, the big boom that we've seen in Africa in the last 10 years is largely as a response of all the extra capital that's been coming out of the boomer generation. And that will be gone in eight years. So you're at the kind of the high point of sub-Saharan African development right now. I'm very bearish on South Africa, although if we come up with a cheap cure to HIV, that'll turn around in a day. Uh, Angola is one to keep in mind. It's not that I'm really a big fan of the Angolan government. To be perfectly blunt, the wrong people won the Civil War. They've already killed a million folks, uh, and they're in the process of basically expanding out their zone of influence. Angola's topography is different from the rest of Africa. It's not plateaus and jungles. It's actually wide open flatlands. And so you can consolidate and kind of expand Russian style over the ages, which is exactly what they're doing. They've intimidated everybody locally. They're killing a lot of people. They actually have a parallel military force that they call ninjas, dress in black, jump out of trees in the middle of the night, kill people, ninjas, literally ninjas, um, that they rent out to their neighbors to kill opposition forces. They've invaded one neighbor. They've thrown a coup in another. The reason I go through all this is Angola imports almost all their food and all their machinery. And so if you don't mind getting into bed with people like that, they need everything. And they will pay cash. Just know who you're getting into bed with. You uh, covered demographics pretty thoroughly from a birth rate standpoint. And you alluded to it a little bit in regards to uh, Europe, uh, you know, maybe in terms of Greece or whatever. But specifically address immigration as sure. it relates to demographics, and particularly in the US. In the United States, uh, about half of our organic growth rate here does come from immigration or the children of immigrants. If it wasn't for immigration, we wouldn't have a European-style demography, nothing like that bad, but it would be narrower and a little older. Uh, a couple things to keep in mind with the United States, though. The uh, volume relative to the population is less than 1% of the population, and it's becoming more diverse. Uh, we get a lot, the Mexicans get a lot of criticism for being the bulk, and they have been historically. But for the last two, three years, it's actually net zero migration from Mexico. More of it's from Central America. Mexico's largely stabilized from a migration point of view. Economically, it's hard to make an argument against immigration. And when you look at the, the tax base of the future, having more people to help the exes pay for the boomer retirement, I think is a brilliant idea. Does it mean that our immigration policy works? No. Does it mean our border security problem doesn't need to be changed? No. Uh, what I would recommend, I really hate recommending things, is that uh, we come up with a worker card program that is renewable, where they actually pay taxes in, but it's not necessarily a path to citizenship unless we choose to make it a path to citizenship in the future. We had something like that during the 70s, uh, took in people who had been devastated by hurricanes in Central America, and it paid for itself within six months. It's not expensive to do, it's not hard to do, because everybody wants that card. But the system we have right now where we don't have a plan either for security or for immigration is kind of the worst of all worlds. And for people who think that we can just guard the border, I'm sorry, it's 2,000 miles long. If we would have put the entire army on that border, that's only one dude every 100 feet. No breaks. Not enough by a factor of 10. Uh, so we need something different. Uh, the challenge I see in immigration is if we don't come up with something different, we have provided a Hispanic ghetto outside of every major city in this country, which means that if you're an illegal Hispanic, you don't have a bank account, you don't have a driver's license, you don't like to go to the cops if there's a problem, that's exactly who the cartels prey upon to rest, recruit, and put down roots. So we've provided the cartels with everything that they need inadvertently. I'm not sure if that spoke to what you were after, I hope so. What's your thought on the proposed uh, $50 billion canal that's being built through or proposed to be built through Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. The, uh, the, the Chinese guy who put forward the investment looks to be a bit of a flake. Uh, and even if it were technically possible, which is questionable, Panama just expanded and we don't need two. Uh, I have no doubt that if it had been built first, we would have never had Panama, but we're not in that situation now. Uh, the Panama Canal expansion comes online over, in phases over the next 18 months. Uh, the fun thing is there's only two ports in the United States, or one port in the United States that can accept the new Panamax ships, and that's in Savannah, Georgia. Everything else goes to Kingston, Jamaica, and is broken down. So it's not going to be a big game changer really for anybody. Maybe the Panamanians, but that's it. 
All right. Got one here in the middle. Any thoughts on the emergence of the Arctic? Could you give me a little bit more to go on? Just in terms of just the shortened transportation routes, sure. just additional oil supplies, et cetera. Uh, the only place that it, the only place it would make sense to go with Arctic transport is Northeast Asia to Northern Europe around the former Soviet space. The problem is that there's not a single port of note along that entire route except for Murmansk. So you're talking about the Russians building a cool trillion dollars of infrastructure to support that route. You also couldn't use it until that area was ice free in the winter because otherwise the aids to navigation would be destroyed each winter. That's not gonna happen even in the most aggressive estimates within the next 20 years. So I, I don't think too much about that. Yeah. Global climate change. You guys are gonna like this answer. Let's assume for the moment that the worst case global climate change happens and we have a rise in temperatures and a rise in sea levels. You guys win. You guys like wins hands down. Because if you move a climate zone a degree or two one way or the other, you know, like this, you might lose some production zones. You might have to produce something different. But the Midwest is a circle. And so if you move it one way or the other, it's not a big deal. The wheat belt in Russia is 100 miles wide and 1,000 miles long. You move that one degree and you've lost access to all the towns, all the infrastructure, all the rail lines. Uh, and then you've got the sea level issue. Let's say sea levels rise 10 meters by 2100. That's the, the biggest uh, estimate I've ever seen. Okay, we lose Miami, you know, good riddance. <laughs> New Orleans has to move upstream 50 miles or so, no big deal. Miami gets a seawall. And then the US is done. We don't have infrastructure down at sea level. Our, all of our cities are up a little bit. But that's the end of Nice and of Rotterdam and of St. Petersburg and of Stockholm and of uh, Durban and Tokyo and Shanghai and Tianjin and Hong Kong and Singapore and Bangkok. You know, it's like you've got roughly a quarter of the world's population facing a very inconvenient future at the same time that the United States is the only reliable food producer. All those marginal lands and places like Australia suddenly are in danger, and in the United States, particularly in the northern Midwest, it's fantastic. So from your economic point of view and maybe even a national security point of view, global warming is good for business. Uh, whether that means you should support it or not, you know, I'll let you guys make that decision yourselves. Is it time? One more, okay, one more. India? Okay, in, the quickest question about what about India? Uh, India has the best and the worst going for it. It's not a major trading nation, never has been, and so if the global trade regime falls apart, the Indians will notice, they won't be happy about it, but it's not a disaster. Uh, India has traditionally been an importer of capital, so they'll face the exact same financial pressures as everybody else. But India is not this lovely story that people think. Uh, the, the Ganges Basin, the heart of India up north, it's not a navigable river, so very low capital generation. But it's the world's great breadbasket. It produces more calories per acre per year than any other place in the world. So high population growth, but absolute poverty. If you're happy working in that environment, well great, India's looked like this for 1,500 years. It's not gonna change because Bretton Woods goes away. But if you think India is about to turn the corner and become richer and start buying more, I'm sorry, India has looked like this for 1,500 years. So if you're happy where it is today, great. All right, and now we're done. Thank you very much.